Hey everybody, Dan Warpaint JKU. This is going to be part two of the axle swap video series. Today we're going to talk about the rear axle, so let's dive on in there. Check it out. Actually, before we start talking and getting underneath the Jeep and checking out the details of that rear axle, we're gonna just quickly mention a couple of things that for time's sake, I did not put in the part one video series, but may have left some unanswered questions. Those two things are gonna be what I did for drive shafts, front and rear, and obviously the ABS traction control wheel speed sensor situation, going from something like a JK, which is pretty electronically sensitive, to a Super Duty axle is obviously a question and it's something that definitely has to be dealt with if you don't want your Jeep to go into limp mode, especially if you have a 2013 or newer vehicle with an automatic transmission. So I'm gonna talk about all that kind of stuff real quick at the end of this video. It's not gonna be a how-to, I'm not gonna walk you through the tuner and show you exactly how to do it. That'll be a whole nother video, but stick around to the end and you can find out how to make sure that your dash does not look like a Christmas tree when you turn this guy on and drive it yeah. down. So the first section of this video is going to be axle selection. Just like the last video in part one, there are two very popular axles that you can get for the rear when you're doing a ton swap. The first one is going to be a Sterling. This obviously is not a Sterling. For those of you that know, we'll get to why in just a second. A Sterling rear axle is a strong axle, but it has an issue when you're gonna swap it into a JK and you don't wanna do things like remove your fuel tank and put a fuel cell in the back. I personally did not wanna do that. Now that Sterling axle, again, you're gonna be tempted to buy one because it's easy. Typically when you find that front axle out of a Super Duty, the rear axle is the Sterling out of that same Super Duty vehicle. So a lot of the time people sell them as a package deal. And it works in a lot of vehicles and it can work in a JK, but I chose not to use it simply because I wanted to leave the factory gas tank in the factory position. I also like a couple of things about the 14 volt, which is the other axle. Now. We'll get under there and I'll show you why the Sterling doesn't work in just a second. But as I just said, the other axle is going to be a 14 bolt. Now, a 14 bolt rear axle comes out of a Chevy 2500. Um, the one that I got happens to be out of a 2002. And there's a couple of different um, features on, on some different 14 bolt axles that we're going to go under and talk about. So let's go check it out. So here we are under the rig checking out this 14 bolt axle. Now from this standpoint or viewpoint, I can also explain to you why the Sterling is not a great option. On the passenger side of a JK, you have a big gas tank over here. And I don't know if you can really see it all that well, but it goes all the way back and it's, it's pretty much stops right before the rear axle. Now that Sterling has has a has a pinion that comes out of the diff just like every other rear axle but it's shifted a little bit more toward the passenger side and as you flex the vehicle uh, it does not clear your gas tank so what some people do is they actually hammer in the gas tank because it's just made of plastic they actually dent it in the problem with doing that comes with then trying to run skid plates and things that are also then kind of have to be dented in um, or they remove that 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 uh, they remove that, that gas tank and they put it in the back of the vehicle and then swap to a fuel cell, that solves the problem. Now, if you're running something like a TJ or an older Jeep that already has a rear gas tank, it will not be an issue. This is purely a JK issue with that Sterling rear end. Now, because of that, wanting to keep my cargo space in the rear for my spare, as you've seen in other YouTube videos, I went with a 14 bolt. Now, let me flip you around and show you why this 14 bolt is particularly special and why you're going to want to look, in my opinion, for this type of 14 bolt axle. All right. So this 14 bolt axle actually has two things that, that differentiate it from other 14 bolt axles. 
It has cooling fins that are cast into the differential on the bottom and on the top. And it also has a pinion that has bolts around it. There are actually six bolts around this pinion carrier, which can be removed separately. If you know anything about doing gears, as soon as you insert that pinion and you get the, the pinion preload right on the pinion bearing up in here, and then you put your ring gear in, your backlash on your ring gear and your gear pattern is also directly related to your pinion depth. So in order to get those two things set up correctly, you constantly have to be removing this pinion, adjusting the depth, putting it back in. But in order to remove the pinion on any other differential, um, I should say on most other differentials, you also have to remove the carrier and the ring gear, which it just adds a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of energy. Now, there's also another reason, and again, I'm not gonna get too far into it, but this pinion, not only does it bolt in, can I remove it without removing that carrier in the ring gear, it also on the other end of the pinion has cast into the diff another bearing, and I believe they call that a carrier bearing. And so basically the end of this pinion sits in another bearing on the other side, which stops pinion deflection under lots of horsepower and under lots of stress. So obviously running big tires, off-road situation, climbing, climbing over, you know, big rocks and big ledges, there's going to be stress on it. I like the simplicity of the 14 bolt. I like the way that the pinion is supported in the 14 bolt. And I like the aftermarket support that they have, but that's why I chose the 14 bolt. Now, obviously, if you're gonna run a 14 bolt or any big rear axle, ground clearance becomes an issue. Your ring gear on these rear axles is so much larger than it is on a Dana 44 that the differential actually hangs down real low. There are two ways that you can handle that and correct that situation. Let's check out what I did on this 14. Okay, so here we are back under the vehicle. As you can see, this diff cover in this center section is awfully big. Now, a 14 bolt, typically is called a 14 bolt because if you count the amount of bolts that hold the diff cover on, there are 14. There are two ways, as I just said a second ago, in order to correct your ground clearance issue when running a larger differential so that it doesn't, you don't have as much hang down. <laughs> anyway, so what I did was I went with a 13 bolt diff cover. And you can see that big flat spot at the bottom of this diff cover, and it gives it a lot more ground clearance if we zoom out and lean back just a tiny bit. Now, all that did was give it an inch and a quarter more ground clearance. As you can see from this photo, the 14 bolt, converting it to a 13 bolt shave gives it, like I said, an inch and a quarter more ground clearance. All you're doing is cutting an inch and a quarter directly off the cast portion of the diff. Now that diff is so thick that on the bottom, the cast portion, when you cut off that inch and a quarter, you're not compromising the strength at all. And there is one other way that you can do this and it's called a shave kit. Now a shave kit is a lot more involved and it is therefore a lot more expensive, even if you do it yourself. This diff cover, I want to say it was like 140 bucks, 150 bucks. I used a Sawzall and a grinder and I cut it off and we were done. A shave kit winds up being closer to $1,000 and then you need a machine shop to cut down your gears because it actually affects the overall diameter of your ring gear a little bit. You have to shave it down like on a mill. Now there are companies that offer pre-cut gears that will work with a shave kit. And that shave kit gives you a little bit more ground clearance, but it comes at, like I said, a big cost. Now, for that $1,000 shave kit, the only thing that you're gonna get over my $150 diff cover is a quarter inch of clearance. That's it. I get an inch and a quarter doing it like this. You get closer to an inch and a half doing an actual shave kit for a ton more money. And anyone that's ever been off-roading knows that if you guys air down your tires and when you when you put an extra couple PSI in them, you get a quarter inch of ground clearance right there. So it's really not that big of a deal. Um, I even know a number of people that are running 14 bolts and haven't even cut them and shaved them and they really don't have any issue depending upon the tire size you're gonna run. So guys, it just wasn't worth it for me to spend that kind of money um, on something that only gave me a tiny bit more ground clearance I don't have any issues with it. I've, I've gotten hung up on my diff, but that's only because I'm climbing really big stuff. Um, 
and again, I just shifted my line over six inches to the passenger to the driver's side and I was able to go right around it, no big deal. Um, we do that all the time with our Dana 44s. It, it really is not a problem. All right, let's move on to the next section of the video, gears and lockers. All right, so when you're talking about gears and lockers on any type of big axle on any off-roading vehicle, as I said in part one, most of that is gonna be covered in a whole nother video on how to, how to select the right gear ratio for your rig. Now, those gear ratios are available for a Sterling. They're also available for a 14 bolt. Now, in this case, because I chose the 14 bolt, that's the axle that we're gonna focus on. Now, I said in the last video in part one that the front axle has the, the availability and the option to choose either an air locker or an electronic locker. Um, the rear axle on a JK is with a 14 bolt is a little bit different. There is no e-locker at this current point in time when this video is being made that anyone makes an e-locker. No one makes one. So you need to run an air locker or you need to run an auto locker, similar to something like a limited slip. Now, I ran again an e-locker in the rear. I wound up making the investment. I bought a small air compressor. I have it mounted in the vehicle. It's not that big of a deal. It wasn't that much added cost. And I like having the selectable on off option of a locker. Now, there's another reason why I also chose an air locker over a limited slip, which is a lot cheaper. If you have an automatic transmission, and if you have a JK that was built after the year 2013, uh, I believe 2013 is included in that, your electronic uh, skid control, your traction control, and your wheel speed sensors, and combined with the sensors that, that measure the output shaft speed of your transmission related to the input shaft speed and all that craziness, are really, really complex and complicated. And unfortunately, when you put an auto locker or a limited slip in the rear of your JK, you run into tons of issues with it turning on traction control and shutting you down when you're trying to make turns and things like that and drive it on the street. With having a air locker that I can turn on, I can turn off, I was able to actually drive this rig on the street and believe it or not, it drives better than it ever did factory with the Dana 44s that were originally under the vehicle. All right, let's talk about that swap truss kit. Swap truss kit on a 14 bolt, super simple. Um, in my case, I bought, again, a rear three link kit, just like I talked about in part one. I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but it, it's the same. Um, the swap truss kit I bought, as you saw a second ago, I zoomed in on it, Barnes, four wheel drive. It simply welds on, again, not because you need a truss. This axle is plenty strong, it's enormous, but you need it to line up your suspension. You need it to wind up getting your springs in the right spot, getting your control arms in the right spot, your shocks in the right spot, things like that. And the swap truss kit from Barnes on a 14 bolt works perfectly, that's what I used. All right guys, let's talk about wheels and bolt patterns. You watched part one, you saw that I kind of hinted at part two. Part one, the Ford Super Duty front axle is gonna be an eight by 170 bolt pattern. The 14 bolt is not an eight by 170. The 14 bolt is an eight by six and a half bolt pattern. So in order to make that work, I had to run an adapter to convert that eight by six and a half to an eight by 170 so I could run the same bolt pattern everywhere. Now, I know what you're thinking about adapters and wheel spacers, but everybody that runs a 14 bolt has to run a wheel spacer because the axle is also three inches narrower than the Dana 60. So even if you just somehow decided to keep the eight by six and a half bolt pattern, you'd still have to run a wheel spacer to make your vehicle three inches wider in the rear so it matches the front. Now, it's just an inch and a half on each side, for a total of that three inches, no big deal. And if you install them correctly and you use red thread lock, everybody that runs a 14 bolt in the rear does this on their vehicle. It is not dangerous, it's perfectly fine. I've never had an issue. Just get a quality wheel spacer, install them correctly, and you're good to go. Now let's move on to the next section of the video, brakes and emergency brake. Now, a 14 bolt, just like that Super Duty front axle that you saw in the part one is 
has enormous brakes. Those vehicles are meant to haul a lot of weight. They're meant to pull big trailers. They have big brakes to stop that amount of weight rolling down the road. And again, you can use factory parts and factory brakes right out of the auto parts store. I bought mine from PowerStop. PowerStop brakes on the rear, new calipers, new rotors, they're dual piston again, and that brake upgrade we talked about in part one under the hood is gonna help you be able to function and move enough fluid to have those brakes actually function correctly. Now, emergency brake is a big deal. People use it a lot when they're off-roading. You're especially gonna use it if you have a manual. Now, the emergency brake on a 14 bolt is a drum style emergency brake, just like it was on the Dana 44. That drum styles actually uses a drum inside the brake rotor and it works as an emergency brake. Now, the factory cables that you run from your emergency brake lever in the vehicle down to the rear axle are not gonna work. Um, they're the different length, they have different connectors on them, it's just simply not gonna work. Fusion 4x4 actually makes a JK swap emergency brake cable kit that does work on the 14 bolt axle for a JK. It basically is a set of brand new cables. Uh, it has the right connectors on them, they're the right length. But here's the catch with that. You have to be 100% sure that you are running them and routing them correctly. There are a lot of people out there that say that those cables, when you go through the forums and on the internet, that they're too long and that they don't work. They work perfectly fine. Uh, you just have to make sure that you route them correctly and that you have the right tension on the spring mechanism in the cab where your emergency brake lever is. If you do it all correctly, uh, mine work great. Um, they would stop the vehicle rolling down the road if I needed it to. All right, guys, here we are at the end of this video. Drive shafts, wheel speed sensors, ABS, all that kind of stuff. I went with a 1350 from Adams. Um, I measured the, the length. I got the length made, it's a 1350 U-joint style solid 1350. I don't get greasable, the inside of them is hollow, uh, and I just feel like the, the solid 1350 are, you know, their extreme duty is what I think they call them. Um, because they're solid, they're just much stronger. I've never had an issue. Um, now, as far as wheel speed sensors go, this is where it kind of gets a little bit complicated. Now, this is a wheel speed sensor for the rear of a JK. Uh, sorry, it's disgustingly dirty, but it's an old wheel speed sensor. Now, you have a wheel speed sensor on the front of your vehicle. You also have wheel speed sensors on the rear. You have one on every corner of the Jeep. Those wheel speed sensors have a little magnetic indicator in the end. You can kind of see it there. It's a little magnetic circle at the end of this, and it picks up those teeth as the wheel turns, that gear turns, and it picks up those teeth, and it basically measures how fast those teeth are passing by the sensor. And if it realizes that one wheel is spinning a lot faster than all the other wheels, it starts to think that it's skidding, sliding, uh, doing a burnout, and it applies your traction control, your skid control, and it prevents you from doing that. So this is something that you can't avoid having on your vehicle. You absolutely need it. Now, the problem becomes the 14 bolt from the factory doesn't have tone rings on it at all. And the Super Duty front axle does, but they're too big. The tone rings have 60 teeth on them, as opposed to having a smaller number of teeth that were on the factory JK. So the computer is a mess. It doesn't know what's going on. The only way that you can fix that, okay, is either by converting it and putting tone rings on the rear, which you're going to have to do. And you can have it done at a machine shop. There's other videos showing how to do it. It's very simple. And you can either set the rear to the factory tone ring, which sounds great because then you don't have to reprogram the computer. The problem is the tone ring in the front is inside the wheel hub bearing assembly and you can't change it. Now, there is a company, Artec Industries, I mentioned them in video one, that does make what they call the super bearing for a super duty. Now, that Super Bearing has the tone ring of a factory JK in a Super Duty hub. The problem is, if any of those hub bearings or anything ever breaks on that, that hub assembly, you can't just go to an auto parts store and pick up a new one. And honestly, guys, that's the benefit of doing this swap. The fact that you can just go to an auto parts store and buy replacement parts for these, none of it really is custom. Uh, all the replacement parts on these axles 
I, they're all from the auto parts store because they were all fleet vehicles. And because you, the stock parts are plenty strong enough because they're meant for vehicles pulling so much weight and hauling so much weight with so much payload capacity over your Jeep. So what I did was I kept the factory 60 tooth tone rings in the front. I bought a set of 60 tooth tone rings for a rear 14 volt. I had a machine shop mill down the, the pub bearing assembly and press them on, on the rear. Um, and I reprogrammed the computer using the J scan for my gear ratio and the tone rings and it works perfectly fine. Again, whole nother video, I will show you specifically how to do that with the new way of doing it in the J scan but it works flawlessly. I've had absolutely no issues. I don't have any weird anti-lock brake stuff happening, but my anti-lock brakes still work. I have no dash lights. It's awesome. And it's factory parts. All right, guys, there you have it. So that I pretty much think is, is most everything on a one-ton swap onto or into a JK. Now, there's a couple of little finer things that I didn't really talk about or go into a lot of detail with. Like for example, on the emergency brake cables, when you put them into the bracket that holds the end of the cable on the rear of a 14 bolt, there's a little bit of drilling you gotta do or, or you know, grinding to make it fit and come in and out and hold the retaining clip and things like that. But that's simple stuff. There's already how to's out there. Also, Stick around as far as re-gearing and things like that go because I'm going to be building another set of one-ton axles, a Super Duty and a 14 bolt, I believe, and putting them into a budget buggy YJ build that I'm planning on doing hopefully this winter. So that build series is gonna come soon. Guys, thanks for the support. Lots more videos to come. Stick around, check them out. Go over, check out the Instagram, and uh, I'll see you guys soon.